On Christmas Day, I watched my favorite movie of all time, It's a Wonderful Life. Many of you are familiar with the story. Jimmy Stewart plays George Bailey, and George Bailey in the movie is faced with a crisis. He's faced with a dilemma. Christmas Eve and his company is $8,000 short. His uncle has lost the money. He doesn't know what to do, so he goes to the bad guy in town. He goes to Mr. Potter to see if Mr. Potter will loan him the money. Mr. Potter says to him, well, do you have any collateral? And all he has is a life insurance policy for $15,000, but it only has $500 cash value on it. The bad guy says to him, you're worth more dead than alive. And Jimmy Stewart's character, George Bailey, is faced with a dilemma, you know. What am I going to do? Am I going to allow myself to be turned into jail, you know, and go to jail? Should I commit? He considers committing suicide because they would get the money that way. Now, all of us at some point in time in our life will face a dilemma just like George Bailey faced in that movie. There'll be choices in front of us, which really it doesn't seem like any choice is a good choice at that point in time. In tonight's passage, we're going to look at David. We're going to look at Saul, the two main characters in the last part of 1 Samuel. And we're going to see that both of them face dilemmas. Both of them have choices in front of them, and it doesn't seem like there is a good choice. And what we hope to do is to learn from their stories and then apply it to our lives so that we will make good choices when we face dilemmas when it seems like there is no good choice. Key point or the big idea tonight is this. When facing a dilemma, we need to understand the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. When we're facing a dilemma, we need to understand the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. Our outline for tonight is going to be just two main sections. As we look at the scriptures here, we'll see David's dilemma. David's dilemma ends up that ultimately he's with the enemies of God. He ends up ultimately with the enemies of God. Saul's dilemma is that ultimately he's without the word of God. So we're going to start by looking at David's dilemma. We're going to look at four points under David or three points under David's dilemma. The first point is the setting. The setting is this. We see as we read the passage, David's afraid. He's afraid that he's going to eventually be killed by Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, it says, David said to himself, one of these days I'll be swept away by Saul. A number of translations use the phrase perish. I'm going to perish by Saul. Obviously, David thinks, okay, Saul's tried to kill me a number of times. He hasn't succeeded yet. But David finally reaches a point in his thinking where he thinks, someday Saul's going to kill me. I've got to do something. He doesn't see that he has a good choice. Uh, in spite of the fact, at the end of the prior chapter, if you flip back in your Bible to chapter 26, verse 25, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. He did not take it. And Saul had even said, he said, he said to David, he said, you'll both accomplish much and surely prevail. David had been anointed king by Samuel. You'll see that back in chapter 16 of First of 1 Samuel. David was anointed king by Samuel, but he seems to waver in his faith here that, you know, oh, am I really going to actually one day get become the king? His statement here seems nothing like the courage he showed before he faced Goliath. When he faced Goliath, he said, the Lord will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. He was bold. He was courageous then. Now, all of us at times can get down, can be discouraged. I mean, elsewhere in the Bible, David's described in the book of Psalms, he's described as a man after God's own heart. But one of the things I appreciate about the Bible, even the heroes, even the greatest characters in the Bible, we see their flaws. They don't always come through. They all, except for one, our Lord Jesus Christ, there's none of them that are without sin. And I want to point out one phrase here as well. The first four words of this chapter says, David said to himself, Remember when I read that, I was just struck by that. It doesn't say that God said to David. It doesn't say that David, you know, David prayed and asked God what to do. It just says, David said to himself. Now, I came upon this quote, and I can put it on the overhead or on the slides here, uh, that I found in a book on 1 Samuel. 
the writer said this. He said, the state of our hearts is often shaped by what we say to our hearts. Here, what David says to his heart undermines his confidence in God. It runs contrary to both the word of God and his experience of God. In contrast, again and again in the Psalms, David speaks the truth about God to his heart, and this restores his faith and hope. To take one example, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God, from Psalm 42, 5. This is a good question to ask ourselves. What am I speaking to my heart today? All of us constantly talk to ourselves, especially when we're in a dilemma, when we're in a crisis. And the key question to ask as we think about this is, what am I saying to myself when I face a dilemma? Am I saying what's true about myself according to what the Bible says, or am I saying things that aren't true? And then likewise, what am I saying or what am I thinking about God? For example, many of us get down on ourselves. Maybe we'll say something like to ourselves like, oh, you're stupid. You're no good. You, you'll never get this right. This is hopeless. I'm never going to get out of this situation. We'll say things to ourselves like that. Is that true according to God's word? Not necessarily. We may even be down on you know, our looks or whatever. We don't consider the truth of the Bible. When the Bible says that we're each one of us fearfully and wonderfully made, that we're made in God's image. And what do you tell yourself about God when you're in a crisis, when you're in a dilemma? Do you tell yourself that God is in control? Do you tell yourself that God's good and that he works everything together for the good of those who love him? Do you remind yourself that he's the almighty, that nothing's too difficult for him? Those are some of the things the Bible says is the truth about God. We need to speak the truth about ourselves. And I'm not saying that we've never sinned or anything like that, but we need to remember what the Bible says about us, what the Bible says about God. And it seems like David wavers in his faith here. I know one pastor who said this. He said, the best of men are men at best. We're still, we all have our flaws. We all have our failures. So David, the setting for David's dilemma is here. He's forgotten about God's promise that he's been anointed king. He's forgotten what Saul said, and he thinks Saul's going to get me. So that's the setting. So David's solution is this. He thinks the best thing to do is to escape Saul and live among the Philistines. He was going to escape Saul and live among the Philistines. Continuing in chapter 27 and verse 1, he, David said, There's nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David set out with his 600 men and went over to Achish, son of Maok, the king of Gath. He now has 600 men with him. Earlier in the book, he only had 400. He's, those who are following him have increased. Now, you may remember earlier in the book, fact, back in chapter 21, David had, won, had went back in chapter 21. He had went and tried to live with the Philistines then. But what had happened then, the Philistines said, well, isn't this the guy that they say David's or Saul's slain his thousands, David his ten thousands? And David had to fake insanity to get away from the Philistines at that point in time. The reason they let him go was because back in that time, that culture, if you thought somebody was insane, they considered it to be bad luck. They, you know, they, would, they didn't touch him. He was smart in faking the insanity. But you may go, well, why does he go back? to the Philistines again when he had to fake insanity the time before. I think the reason for it is this. When he first had went to Achish and Gath back in chapter 21, that was very early on and not very many people knew yet that Saul was jealous of David and was trying to kill him. By this point in time, Saul's been chasing David long enough that not only do, does most everybody in Israel know that Saul's after David, even the enemies of the Israelites, the Philistines, recognize, oh, Saul's trying to kill David. So, yeah, Achish gives him place. He's got 600 men. It's like, okay, well, he, Saul's his enemy, so, yeah, he must be, you know, he, he can probably help us out as well. And David's solution was to flee. It seems like it works at first. In verse 4, it says, when it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. So it seems like his solution works. The rest of chapter 27, we're not going to look at the verses, but essentially David asks 
Achish for a town where he can settle in. It says that they stay there for over a year, for 16 months. It says they raid some of the other tribes, but he lies to Achish. Tells him, he says, well, we were raiding Israel. And so Achish thinks, yeah, the Israelites are mad at him. Um, doesn't really tell us whether what David's doing is right or wrong. You can come to your own conclusions there. But essentially, the result of this is this. As we get to chapter 28, the first two verses, we see David's with the enemies of God. And he's with the enemies of God when the Philistines say, oh, let's go take them. Let's go attack the Israelites. We'll see here. In, verse, in chapter 28 and verse 1, then it says, At that time the Philistines gathered their military units into one army to fight against Israel. So Achish said to David, You know, of course, that you and your men must march out in the army with me. David replied to Achish, Good, you'll find out what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, Very well, I'll appoint you as my permanent bodyguard. Now, don't know for sure what David was thinking. He responded probably the only way that he could respond here. Um, but David's in a bad point. His first dilemma was he thought that Saul was going to kill him, so he thinks the solution is to escape to the Philistines. But now he finds himself in another dilemma. Now he's with the enemies of his people, and they want him to go out and fight his people with them. Interesting little point here at the end of this verse where Achish says to David, he says, I'll appoint you as my permanent bodyguard. Literally, in the Hebrew, those words are the guard of my head. The King James Version actually uses the words keeper of my head. It's interesting that the king of Gath, which was the city that the giant Goliath was from, the king of Gath says to David, you're going to be the keeper of my head. Well, what did David do with their champion's head not too far back? He, but anyway, it seems like he trusts David. Now, at this point, interestingly, the story shifts to Saul's dilemma. In fact, the writer even takes things out of chronological order. If you look closely in chapter 29, chapter 29 should continue the story of David at this point, but the writer must have had a reason for switching and talking about what was happening with Saul at this time because chapter 29 verse 1 talks about the Philistine armies assembling and we'll see here, this is it. Well, we'll get into it as we get to the verses. You'll see that. But, so David's dilemma Looked at that so far, he's with the enemies of God. But I believe the reason the writer brings this up and when he switches the scenes out of chronological order, he wants to show us that even though David was in a bad situation, Saul was in a worse situation. David was with the enemies of God. Saul did not have God's word. He was without the word of God. Sometimes there's worse, something worse than being with our enemies. That's not having God's word. So again, we're going to look at Saul's dilemma. We're going to look at three points there as well. The setting, Saul's solution, and the result. So the first part, the setting in chapter 28, verses 3 through 6. The setting is we see that Samuel has died. In verse 3, it says, By this time Samuel had died. All Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his city. The writer here is just reminding us of something that's already happened, something that he actually told us about back in chapter 25, verse 1. He said, Samuel had died. So he's reminded us, here's the first part of the setting, Samuel's died. Second point, second bullet point is this, Saul had removed the Medians and Spiritus from the land. Text pretty well says that same thing in verse 3, it says, and Saul had removed the Medians and Spiritus from the land. Now, you may ask yourself this question, you may go, okay, what's a medium? What's a Spiritus? Here's the definitions I, I found when I looked them up. A medium is a necromancer. That word necromancy simply means those who try to contact, to, to make contact or communicate with the dead. So a necromancer or those who communicate with the dead. Spiritus, some translations use the word soothsayer. Some actually use the word necromancer for spiritus. It says those who contact spirits. Essentially, I think there are two words that mean the same thing. A necromancer or a spiritus was someone who tries to communicate with the dead or who tries to communicate with the spirits of the dead. Now, some of you may think, okay, well, that happened, you know, way back then. You know, people don't do things like that now today, do they? Actually, very interesting, the Des Moines Register, the last two weeks, they have a series, you've maybe heard of it or seen it, called Storytellers Project. Less than two weeks ago on Monday, there was uh, the headline in the Iowa Life section said, How I Learned to Love My Psychic Powers. And I'm going to take a quote directly from the article, put it on the overhead here. 
I don't know this person at all. I'm not saying that they're a bad person, but here's what they said in their own words. It, is, it was easier than admitting to people and myself who I really was, a medium. That was her words. I spend my days helping people connect with their spirits and their loved ones who have passed. Her very own words. We still have people who serve as mediums and spiritists today, just as they did in Saul's day as well. So we ask the next question then, what's the Bible say about these? What's the Bible say about mediums and spiritists? We'll look at just a few verses. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, in verses 10 through 11, the gist of those verses says this, no one among you is to consult a medium or a spiritist or inquire of the dead. Leviticus 19 verse 31 says something very similar. It says, do not turn to mediums or consult spiritists or you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So it says very clearly in those two passages, you're not to contact, the people of Israel were not to contact, they weren't to communicate or consult with a spiritist or a medium, someone who tries to contact the dead or tries to contact the spirits of the dead and said they would be defiled, they'd be spoiled or polluted or marred by them. Now, so by God's law, mediums and spiritists were to be banned from Israel. All, all that Saul really was doing was just putting into effect what God had said into his word when he removed the mediums and spiritists. And not only that, one last verse we will look at in connection with this, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27, said a man or a woman who is a medium or a spiritist is to, must be put to death. They are to be stoned. Their death is their own fault. This was the Old Testament law, a medium or a spiritist, somebody who made contact with the dead or tried to contact spirits was to be stoned, was to be put to death. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should do the same thing today. That's not the laws in our, con in our country. But I am saying the Bible is really clear that God's people should not have anything to do with mediums, spiritists, trying to contact the dead or trying to contact spirits. So we see here, the setting for Saul for his dilemma. Samuel's dead. Saul's removed the medians and spiritists from the land. Third bullet point we see is this. Saul was afraid of the Philistines who had come out to fight them. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 28, it says, The Philistines gathered and camped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel, and they camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine camp, he was afraid, and his heart pounded. Saul was really afraid. He saw this massive army coming up against him. He didn't know what to do. Now, just to give you a little bit of a picture of this, we can go to the next slide. We'll show you down here. So here's part of map of Israel back in that time period. Here are the Philistines. There's like the five main cities of the Philistines here, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. In chapter 29, verse 1, I said, is really chronologically the order. It says that they gathered together at Aphek back in 29, but here in chapter 28, it says the Philistines then moved up and they camped at Shunem. Here's Shunem in the Jezreel Valley. Had the opportunity to be in Israel four years ago. Been in the Jezreel Valley. It says the Israelites were on Mount Gilboa. Mount Gilboa is a long hill, a ridge that's about five miles long. So the Israelites are camped here. Saul's deathly afraid. He sees the Philistines right here at Shunem. And one other place, just remember this place right here, Endor is going to come up here in the text in just a little bit. So... Keep those places in mind. So anyway, Saul's afraid. He sees the Philistines. He sees their army coming up against him. The last point as far as the setting is this. It says very clearly that the Lord did not answer Saul. In verse 6 of the chapter, it says, He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him in dreams or by the Urim or by the prophets. Now you may say, okay. Sometimes in the Old Testament, we see God gave people dreams. It seems like maybe even at times there's people who think that God speaks to us too through dreams today, but I'd say it's not his primary method. But it also says, Saul, Saul's trying to find out what the Lord wants. He's trying to inquire of the Lord. It says he, the Lord didn't answer him by the Urim. You may go, what's the Urim? We don't know a lot about it, but the Old Testament talks about the Urim and the Thummim, and they were used by the priests in the Old Testament. Somehow they were used to discern what God's will was for his people. They were kept. The Old Testament priests had a robe and they had like an ephod and a breastplate and they would put this human and throw them in the breastplate. Now, part of the fact that the Lord didn't answer Saul was his own doing. You might remember back in chapter 22, 
Saul got angry with the priests. He thought that the priests had been helping David. He killed a large number of the priests. I don't remember the number right now. I think it was in the 80s, if I remember, 80, 85. I'd have to go back and look. It says that one priest escaped, and that one priest escaped, and he took the breastplate with him that would have had the Urim in it. So, you know, Saul's got rid of all the priests. The Lord's not going to be able to answer him by the Urim. And why should he answer him by the prophets? He's already given him the prophet Samuel, and Saul has really disregarded the things that Samuel has told him. So why should the Lord answer him? Now, you might still ask yourself, and I ask myself the question, well, God's a gracious God. You know, why didn't he answer Saul? Psalm 66, verse 18 came to my mind. In it, the psalmist wrote this. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will, will not hear. When I think of Saul, one of the things that came to mind when I think of Saul, uh, I actually think of Frank Sinatra's old song, I Did It My Way. Now, some of you probably too young maybe to remember it, but it is a pretty famous song. But it seems like that that's what Saul, he kind of wanted to do things God, God's way, but uh, when push came to shove, it's like, uh, okay, I'm going to kind of do it God's way, but I'm not really going to come, you know, I'm going to do it the way that I think's best. Saul essentially rebelled. He sinned. He did things his way. He regarded iniquity in his heart. It's no wonder the Lord didn't answer him because he didn't think it was, you know, he, he thought his way was better than obeying God. In fact, you might remember back in chapter 15, verse 22, the last time that Saul was with Samuel, Samuel rebuked Saul and says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Saul had tried to sacrifice to the Lord, but he hadn't obeyed what God had told him to do. So that's the setting. Samuel's died. Saul's removed the medians. He's afraid of the Philistines coming to fight him, and the Lord's not answering him. So what's his solution? What's he come up with in this dilemma he's facing? It doesn't seem like there's any good choice for him. His solution then is to consult a medium. That's the solution he came up with. So we continue the text. In verse 7, it says, Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who's a medium so I can go and consult her. Now, it seems rather ironic. He's banned. The Israelites were not to consult mediums, as we already saw and looked at verses along those lines. It's ironic. He's removed the mediums from the land, but now he says, well, it seems like this is the only good choice. I need to get some sort of direction. I need help here. So interestingly, even though he's banned the mediums from the land, it says his servants replied, there's a woman at Endor who's a medium. So remember, she's at Endor. Showed that on the map a little bit ago. So verse 28, it says, Saul disguised himself by putting on different clothes and set out with two of his men. Why did he disguise himself? I think there's one reason for sure, and maybe possibly a second one. First reason probably would be, well, he's removed the mediums and the spiritists from the lands, and we saw that in the old, according to the Old Testament law, they were to be killed, they were to be stoned. So if he's going to a medium, the medium sees him in his kingly robes. It's like she knows what he's done. He's tried to remove him. You know, why is she, if he wants to consult a medium, she's definitely not going to do what he wants when he knows, when she knows he's the king. A second reason might be, if you remember that map, you had Mount Gilboa down here, then you had like uh, Shunem here, and then Endor up here. But Saul probably had to go very close by the Philistines, even though he went at night. He probably had to go fairly close to where their army was camped. Probably didn't want to be out in his kingly robe, so it was just, a oh, hey, there's their king. Let's just go get him right now. We can, you know, we can, we can uh, wipe him out. All's well that ends well. But, so he disguised himself says, they came to the woman at night, and Saul said to the medium, consult a spirit for me. Bring up for me the one I tell you. And the woman's response, she says in verse 9, the woman said to him, you surely know what Saul has done. She doesn't realize it's Saul at this point. How he's cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why are you setting a trap for me to get killed? Again, we saw according to Old Testament law, she was to be killed. She knew that. She was afraid this was a guy that was just, you know, that he was a plant. Somebody who, you know, Saul had sent him and, and you know, ultimately he was going to kill her. Now, I'm not sure why. Saul reassures her in the next verse. In verse 10 it says, Then Saul swore to her by the Lord, 
As surely as the Lord lives, no punishment will come to you from this. It's interesting that Saul brings the Lord in when he's doing exactly what God has told him not to do. But he says, okay, you aren't going to be punished. Well, God has said she should be punished. Again, Saul's doing things his way. He's singing a song. I'm, I'm going to do it my way. He's doing it his way. And ironically, he's seeking help from a source that God has condemned and has told them not to consult. So in verse 11, the woman responds. She says, who is it that you want me to bring up for you? The woman asked. And bring up Samuel for me, he answered. So lets her know who he, who he wants her to bring up. Verse 12, it says, when the woman saw Samuel, she screamed. And then she asked Saul, why did you deceive me? You're Saul. First question comes to mind, why did the woman scream? The text here indicates that she saw Samuel. And it seems to imply that she didn't really expect to see Samuel. I think she expected to see a demonic spirit who was imitating Samuel. I don't think she had ever... It seems like this had never, nothing like this had ever happened before. She saw Samuel and then somehow she realized, well, who really wants to talk to Samuel in this, at this time? It's, she recognized that it was Saul and she's accusing Saul of deceiving her and she's probably screaming as well thinking, oh, wait, you know, you've promised me you wouldn't kill me, but you're Saul, you've, 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 you know, you've removed all the mediums and spiritists from the lands, you can, you can kill me. So she's probably afraid Saul's going to kill her. Now, that Samuel's appearance wasn't, did not appear to be the expected, what this lady expected. It seems like that this is something very unique. Never seen anything else quite like this in Scripture. I think she realizes this isn't something I did by my powers, by my abilities. I think she recognizes that God has done this. It's God's power. And I think this shows that really mediums, those who try to contact the dead, really have no real power over the deceased, they can only produce counterfeits. So I thought about this, I read some things. Some people say, well, mediums are fakes. And I think there's some truth to that. I think there's probably a number of mediums who probably are fakes, who try to get us, you know, to feel some strange sensations. And may, it seems like there's definitely some an amount of fake to this woman because it seems like she is really freaked out. She screams when something happens that she didn't expect to happen. The text says that Samuel, you know, she saw Samuel. But even though some mediums are fakes, I think there's a sense in which we need to recognize there can be a reality. Mediums try to contact the spirits of the dead. They try to contact demonic spirits. The Bible says very clearly this world is not all that there is. There is another world and that not all those spirits are, are you know, are... Uh, our good spirits are on our sides. It seems like that this really is, well, the, the woman probably was used to encountering demons. The Bible's really clear on this. The Bible says the dead don't speak. Didn't put this on my overhead slides, but in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Men die and they're judged. That's the normal course, biblically, to what happens. People don't come back. They don't haunt this earth. If mediums and spiritists are contacting some spirits and, and demons, if the Bible says there is a realm of the angels and the demons, they can observe what's going on. I mean, I, I have no problem with a demon probably giving information that you'd think nobody else would know. They're able to observe. I think they're able to observe our world in fact, it's very clear again and as well in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 14 and going on into verse 15, it says, even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. The Bible is very clear. We should have nothing to do with contacting demons, with trying to make contact to communicate with the dead. I think the Bible is clear that the dead... I think this is a unique, one unique extraordinary event, but we should have nothing to do with that world or with that realm. Anyway, focusing back upon the text, the woman's freaked out. She screams. She asks, she says, well, you're Saul. Why'd you trick me? You deceived me. Saul tries to reassure her. In the next verse, in verse 13, it says, the king said to her, don't be afraid. 
What do you see? Saul's still desperate. He's got this dilemma. He doesn't know how to solve it. So the woman goes on. She says, I see a spirit coming up out of the earth, the woman answered. In verse 14, it says, it continues, then Saul asked her, what's he look like? An old man is coming up, she replied. He's wearing a robe. It says, then Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he knelt low with his face to the ground and paid homage. I think it's interesting that it says, Saul knew that it was Samuel after the woman described him as wearing a robe. Brings back to my mind back in chapter 15 when, when Samuel had told Saul, you know, uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. And he said, you know, the Lord's taking the kingdom from you. You might remember the last thing that happened as Samuel starts to walk away. Back in that chapter, Saul had reached out, he grabbed his robe, and he had actually ripped Samuel's robe as he was walking away from him. Now, I know the text doesn't say it here, but that would be one very simple way to discern, oh, this did really, oh, guy's got a ripped robe. Yeah, it's definitely Samuel. Regardless of whether that was what happened or not, it says Saul knew it was Samuel. He bowed low. He paid homage to him. And it goes on. It says that Samuel then responded to Saul. It says in verse 15, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Samuel asked Saul. Saul says, Well, I'm in serious trouble. The Philistines are fighting against me. And God's turned away from me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either through the prophets or in dreams. So I've called on you to tell me what to do. Saul's in a desperate dilemma. He doesn't know what to do. God's not answering him. The Philistines are fighting against him. What he really wants, he really wants God's help. Then maybe he could face the battle with hope. But he has ignored what God, the instructions God's given him in the past. God's no longer communicating with him. It's interesting. Oftentimes people will ignore what God says. But then when they're really in trouble, they want it, they're in a jam, they pray, they want God to help them. God doesn't answer them. They think there's no God. Well, they've ignored God. God's given them exactly what they want. They, you know, they, they've turned their back on God, so why should, why should God answer them? Some people, likewise in this situation, or Saul desperately wanted help from someone, so he thought if he contacted Samuel. Some people will, in our culture today, will go to mediums because they can't bear to live without someone, a loved one that they've lost. Do, they'll do anything to try to reestablish contact. But effectively, that's really idolatry. They, they're thinking, I can't live without this. They're, they're, they're taking anything or anyone that substitutes for God really is idolatry. The problem for us is not that God hasn't spoken to us. And that was the same thing for Saul. God had spoken to him. He just didn't want to hear what God had said to him. As Christians, many of us today, we may want to hear God speak, but we don't listen to what he's already said. We, don't, we set our Bible on the shelf. We don't read it. As Christians, if we want to hear God speak to us, as Saul wanted God to speak to him, we've got God's word already. We need to take his word. We need the Bible Oftentimes, we may want a word from God without reading his words. So we've seen the setting, seen Saul's solution. He thinks the best thing for me to do is to consult a medium so I can bring Samuel back up. And the result, he realizes ultimately that the Lord is his enemy and that he's still without God's word. Verses 16 going on says, Samuel answered, Since the Lord has turned away from you and has become your enemy, why are you asking me? God had become Saul's enemy. And Samuel says, the Lord has done exactly what he said through me. The Lord has torn the kingship out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Goes on in verse 18, he said, you did not obey the Lord and did not carry out his burning anger against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will also hand Israel over to the Philistines along with you. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, and the Lord will hand Israel's army over to the Philistines. Samuel predicts Saul's defeat, the death of his sons. He said, you know, Saul, why are you doing this? God's already told you, you know, the kingship's been taken from you. You haven't obeyed him. Um, so that's what we see the result is. Saul is still without God's word. Uh, and he really is in a hopeless situation because of what he has done in the past. Now, 
Don't have time to cover the last few verses in chapter 28. You can kind of look at those as being uh, Saul's last supper. I want to go back, as we, before we close, just to go back to the key point. Remember what we said at the beginning. When we're facing a dilemma, we need to understand the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. So I want to give you some application points tonight that will help us in that regard. In this passage, we've seen both David and Saul face dilemmas. In his dilemma, David said to himself, something that wasn't true. God had promised him the kingdom, but he thought that Saul was eventually going to kill him. God had delivered him a number of times from Saul, just as God had earlier delivered him from the lion, from the bear, and even from Goliath, the Philistine giant. So David didn't really understand the truth at this point anyway. Saul didn't understand the truth about himself as well. He thought he could do things, quote, his way, and still get God's blessing and still have God speak to him and lead him and guide him. He was wrong. He tried to do things kind of God's way, but eh, I still am going to do it my way. And he didn't understand the truth about God. He didn't realize how holy God is and that God does expect our obedience. He expected Saul's obedience. So we're going to give you three applications tonight. First is this. Speak the truth to yourself especially about God. We need to speak the truth to ourselves and the truth about God. Remember back in chapter 27, verse 1, where it says, David said to himself. We said there, the, shape, the, <clears throat> the state of our hearts often shaped by what we say to our hearts. And we looked at Psalm 42, verse 5, which said, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. That was in the quote that I'd found from the book. I love this verse. Because God really used it in my life many years ago. In fact, one of the first six years that I was out of college, I taught high school math and I coached. And oftentimes I got down, I got discouraged, I got depressed. And I remember this verse stood out to me. Psalm 42, verse 5. Actually, from Psalm 42 through Psalm 43, three times in those two psalms, you have essentially this same phrase repeated. Psalm 42, 5, Psalm 42, 11. I think it's Psalm 43, 5, if I remember as well. It says, why are you downcast? Why are you disturbed? Put your hope in God. And I remember back when I got down, when I got discouraged, I felt like God was speaking to me from his word very clearly, saying, Bruce, here's the problem. You're putting your hope in you. You're putting your hope in your abilities and the, that you're going to be able to be a great teacher and a great coach. And it's like, no. Don't put your hope in you, Bruce. Put your hope in me. And I remember I started thinking of it when I started to get discouraged, when I started to get depressed. And I'm not perfect at this by any means, but it has been a help for me for many years that when I start to get discouraged, it's like, oh yeah, duh, Bruce, where's your hope? Is your hope in God or are you hoping in yourself? We need to put our hope in God. We need to speak the truth about God. In fact, Romans 15, verse 13. I don't have it up on the overhead, but Romans 15, 13, a great verse. If you don't know this, I'd encourage you to memorize this. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says very clearly there to us that God is the God of hope. If we're discouraged, if we're down, if we feel like our situation is hopeless, it's not true. God's the God of hope. We need to speak the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. So that's first application. Second application. When you want to hear God speaking to you, read the Bible. Saul wanted to hear God speak to him, but he couldn't because he did things his way. He regarded iniquity in his heart. It says very clearly in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, all scripture is inspired by God. That word inspired literally means God breathed. I know there's one translation that actually uses that word for this verse. All scripture is God breathed. If you want to hear God speak to you, Saul wanted to hear God speak to him, but he ignored the words that God had given him. I'm afraid many times as Christians, we still ignore God's word. You want to hear God speak to you, read his word. Now, I would recommend very strongly that you have a plan. Some people will use, if they're not accustomed to have, if they don't have a habit of reading the Bible, they'll use what I call the open and point method. They'll open the Bible, point their finger, and they may point at a verse like this. Judas went out and hanged himself. Hmm. Not very encouraging. Let's see. Let's try it again. Try it again. Oh, 
go therefore and do likewise. Mm, that doesn't seem good either. That can't be right. Let's do it one more time. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it quickly. You know, don't, don't use the point, open and point method. Have a plan, all right? Now, if you don't have a plan, New Year's coming here. If you don't have a plan, here's what I encourage you both on. The Walnut Creek Church app, most of you have a cell phone. You can get, there's a Bible reading plan on the Walnut Creek Church app. And for those of you, if you're not high tech, they actually, Matt Crummy got me these. They're, they're out at the welcome table, a one-year New Testament Bible reading plan. This is a plan where you just read for five minutes a day, five days a week. You will read through the entire New Testament in less than a year if you follow this plan. If you're not, if it's, if it's not a habit in your life, each of us can take five minutes. If you want God's, God to speak to you, develop a habit of your life, sitting, reading his word. Uh, God wants to speak to us. He wants to speak to us through his word. Just as he spoke to me many years ago through Psalm 42, 5. He wants to speak to us. We need to be in his word to hear his voice. Last application. I asked myself this. As I read the passage I thought about, it, I thought, how does this passage point us back to Jesus? How does it point it back to the Lord? And I think, here, here's what I came up with. Like Saul, we may want someone, at some point in time in our lives when we're grieving, when we miss someone we've loved dearly, maybe we'll want somebody to come back from the dead and talk to us. The truth is this. We need to remember that we already have someone who's come back from the dead with words of reassurance from God. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He suffered and died. He paid the price for your sin and for my sin on the cross. But the grave couldn't hold him. He came back from the grave. He rose from the dead. We have someone who has come back from the dead. We don't need to contact mediums or spiritists to talk to someone who has, who's come back from the dead. We have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The very last words he gave to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew, anyway, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you just for the opportunity that we have to look at your word. Lord, help us to be ones who put your word into practice. Help us, Lord, to speak the truth to ourselves and especially the truth about you. I thank you, Lord, that you're a God who's sovereign, who's in control, that who works everything together for good in our lives, that nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. You're the Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God of hope as well. There's no hopeless situation when you're involved. Help us, Lord. When we want to hear you speak to us, help us to be a people who are in your word, who are reading the Bible. And Lord, when we face a dilemma and we, when we think we need to have someone come back to us from the dead with words of reassurance, help us to remember we have you, Jesus. You're the one who rose from the dead. You conquered the grave. You're with us always. We thank you for that, Lord. So thank you for your word tonight. Help us, Lord, to learn from it and to live it out in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.